Is um, that your luggage? No, it's not your luggage. That might be a bit of an issue. It, oh, it's your luggage. Did you uh, pack that luggage yourself? It was? Okay. And it's been in, under your control the whole time while you were here? I'm asking you these questions because I'm afraid somebody may have compromised your personal security and given you something that will compromise you. This is a question we get probably this evening, right? People will ask us questions and say, how are you doing? And guess what? We all are docile. We, ex we expect that when we come in, we get all of these questions and we act like we're supposed to act. When do you, when do you remember uh, when the body scanners were introduced on airports? It was an event in um, 25th of December, 29, when a guy decided to stuff a bomb down his pants. And we basically didn't have security controls to deal with that. So all of a sudden, whole communities of people started being exposed to security measures that were tightened. And we all accepted it. We dealt with it. Airports are a great analogy to zero trust approaches, if, if we think about it. Because if you get to the airport, everybody's allowed to enter. People are waving a, a goodbye to their families. It's an open area, and you're just allowed to walk in, just like we do on our networks most of the time. Airports, however, started implementing least privileged um, strategy a long time ago because they figured you don't have to be where you don't have to be, and it makes perfect sense to us. So we get in, and we get through a security gate. The only way to get through a security gate is if you have a boarding pass, right? So you get scanned. So the people who are waving and said, have a nice holiday, goodbye, be safe and be, be sound, they effectively stay behind that barrier because they have no reason to be in that part of the network. The next step would be that should we want to board our flight finally, again, we are checked. We're checked against, are you allowed to be at this gate and are you allowed to board this plane? So another layer of security is introduced and we again have to prove using certain credentials that we are allowed to actually get into that part of the network for the airports. This, the part we usually don't get authorization to be, but some people do, would be to get into the actual cabin. And these are the guys protecting the crown jewels, which is the money they earn by transporting us like cattle in economy. I didn't say cattle, did I? What we put on top of that is more and more strict user authentication. If you think about it, most of your passports now have biometrics. So maybe a scan of your fingerprint sitting in the airport. In some airports, you've got iris scanners. And uh, the, the challenge with those technologies is that they're very strong as an authentication measure. But once compromised, we get into a bit of an issue. Airports get that. They don't store your fingerprints. Some governments, greedy for data as they are, they still try to collect that data and post it in the database. A big security risk if you ask me, but a topic for a different uh, page. So we get authenticated. So all of this is coming together. Then airports also have this scan, right? We, we remember this, this bomber guy, he did something that we didn't have in our procedures. So now all of our luggage, all of our content is scanned. You would figure that after, what, 15, 20 years, Probably people have figured out by now what they are allowed and what they are not allowed to take into the airport, correct? How often do you find yourself standing behind a person, oh, I'm not allowed to take a liter bottle of water into the airport, and you're going to force me to buy another one at the, at the back end of this for a huge uh, uplift? It happens to us all the time. People still take knives and they take all kinds of stuff that we don't want them to do. So it's very clear to everybody because all the other people in the line are going to be, Jesus. How long does it take you to figure out this is not the cool? I'm, I'm in a hurry. I need to catch my flight. What's wrong with you? So a lot of people were effectively trained to get working into a point where uh, they know what to do, they follow procedure, and they go, they go on it. In 2020, which should be called the year of perfect vision if you think about it, Airports do the same thing. They collect lots of information. There is literally thousands of cameras sitting in an airport where all kinds of feeds are coming in. And as a guy who's looking at all the feeds, if we don't apply something, some intelligence, some management skill um, around that, this guy is just looking at a, a whole, whole bunch of feeds and will never be able to correlate between that. Airports don't do that. Airports probably know that a person of interest is going to arrive to the airport and the cameras are going to be tuned and the guy sitting behind the desk 
getting the perfect vision on everything that's going on in his network, already knows because a flag is going to go up and somebody's going to be monitored while they, while they make their way throughout the network because they may be of interest, but they may also be uh, no risk at this moment in time. So visibility is absolutely a very big thing. It's a big key element in trying to do security inside those networks. We see that in order to do that in an airport, you need to set a, a number of objectives. So one of them, obviously, is to go for zero false negatives. You do not want to miss that gun that accidentally was in the suitcase. That's a no-no, right? It's very clear. All of you are, are nodding your heads. Wait until we get back to you with a POC and we show you that people in your networks are carrying guns inside of their laptops and they're trying to shoot their way around in the network. So this is a given. We all accept it. Can't go through, has to go out. If you bring a gun, you got to leave it behind. If you bring a bottle of water, you got to leave it behind. We also accept a low, f low false positive level. How often do you go through said body scanner and some man starts touching you or woman, if, and in some countries you actually get touched by uh, somebody from the other sex, like in, in Denmark. That was surprising the first time that happened. But we accept it, you know, automatically. Sir, please go to the booth. You're going to be like, okay, here we go. You're done, thank you. And then you go and collect your stuff again. Accept it, part of security procedure, accept it, this is what we do. The third thing is, we try to make it as seamless as we can. I don't know if you ever noticed it, but any airport you go to in the world, the procedure is 99% the same. The few differences we see is here you need to remove your buckle and there you don't, and actually, Starting as of recent in Amsterdam, you no longer have to remove your bottles of water from your luggage and you're allowed to take it through. That's innovation for airports. It took them about, what, 11 years to be able to scan a bottle of water, but hey, we're getting there, so it's allowed now. For users, that's a great thing because users know, and we as travelers obviously know, whatever airport we go to, there's a rhythm and there's a cadence and there's a process that we need to follow and once we've done it, we can go and sit down at the gate and start doing our email again. In that, we um, need to connect it back into Zero Trust. So if we look at how Checkpoint does Zero Trust using the Infinity architecture, all of those elements are coming back. So we need to paint a complete picture. We need to provide an ability to address all the areas that Zero Trust comes with. The obvious ones, networks, devices, uh, people. But today we also see new elements introduced, um, such as workloads, and which should be a larger topic than it is today, data. We consider data to be super important. We think data is the one key value that we have inside of our networks. Yet if I ask the people in the room here to raise their hands and say, who's doing HTTPS inspection in a network? I do not get the majority, do I? And then we say, how much of your traffic is HTTPS encrypted? Probably 70%. I usually ask the f that question first and then I ask how much of inspection do you do? Then I tell them, look, thank you for being a Checkpoint customer. We really appreciate your business. But why do you not leverage all of our technology and actually look and protect your crown jewels while you do it? And there's many reasons. There's cost and there's performance and there's privacy. But in the end, at some point, we're going to find ourselves at that spot. We're going to find ourselves in a place where we have to look inside of that VPN tunnel. And I predict it's not going to happen like that. I predict we're going to be looking at the endpoints of the tunnel. We just need to find a way to get there. Things will have to be efficient, so you cannot tie together a gazillion products and try and, and think uh, that you have the control over everything that's happening inside there. And obviously, as Gil also explained on this stage, it will have to be preventative. It doesn't help that the pilot gets a call from the security check when he's in the air and says, you know what, that, that suitcase we scanned, it actually contained the gun. You might have an issue on, on your flight at this moment. This is the analogy, right? This is the analogy back to our networks again. When we look at the new worlds that we're facing at the moment, we also see new challenges are coming in and the old paradigm of protecting networks is no longer going to cut it. If we stick to having to define each element in a network, we may be faced with an issue. Because as TJ explained on the stage, DevOps are not going to wait for you. If you can't facilitate them, they're going to find a way around you. So when workloads are going to be extended or added into the networks, 
or uh, shrinking because the load is no longer there. We always talk about extending, but you also have an ability to shrink, which is a very good cost-effective element. We will have to find a way to tag that and to start working based on the expected behavior or the grouping that we do based on such applications, rather than the fact that it may be getting an IP address to communicate inside of the network. It will also introduce new technologies that we will have to apply. Micro-segmentation will become more viable, but things like uh, running runtime analysis or uh, vulnerability scanning, not something we've been doing out of checkpoint technology until now, but this will be part of your world. If we look in the office, we also see that we got multiple devices that we care about. The pets in our offices are the servers and the laptops and the kettle is more or less the video cameras and the sensors and the printers and until Odette Venuno and his gurus uh, managed to hack printers, we never thought about that as an attack vector into your network. But you know what? They can. They were on stage showing us there's additional elements in the network that might, might present themselves as a risk. So we have to find a way for those to start predicting behavior, trying to find a way to enforce security the best way possible and feeding it with the intelligence around threats and the expected behavior of those very specific devices. In doing that with the nano agent technology, we'll find a way to allow you to build a policy based on expected behavior and do the enforcement as strong as we can based on the device where finally the technology is going to be deployed, whether it's a few lines of code or a full-fledged agent being able to do a lot of inspection by itself. Not doing anything is the biggest risk we have here, and I feel this is a greenfield. Not too many people have investigated building automation security or uh, sensor level automation security. We're definitely going to be there. Zero trust will also apply to people. People will have to be able to authenticate themselves in order to access a service. But if the service is no longer on a physical server, IP addresses are not going to do it. So we'll have to find a way to identify users. That's an existing technology, of course, and integrate it back into Checkpoint. And we're trying to aim for that seamless experience. So we'll have to aim and find a way that says, I'm going to challenge the user to authenticate himself, but I'm not actually going to prompt him. I'm going to find a way to establish the identity and reuse it on every single activity they do. Because I cannot one time ac uh, allow access and then just keep it open as, a, as an open communication channel. If they start working with micro-based services, I don't know what server they're going to connect to. It's going to be a new network connection to me. They will have to be authenticated, but I cannot prompt them the whole time. That means you can start building security policies that will be based on actual applications rather than port numbers or IP addresses or anything like that. That allows you to very finely uh, detail where people are allowed to go and where they're not allowed to go. One of the bigger challenges here, for you guys to find out what those policies are in your company. That's probably the biggest point, right? What, what actually is our policy around this? Uh, speaker after me is going to talk uh, how we uh, overcome those challenges in the inside of Checkpoint for him as a, as a CISO. The user experience should be as seamless as possible. So once the user finally ends, ends up at the gate and they start opening their email and they click on that link and oh, they're a bit distracted and maybe they're a bit anxious because they don't fly every day, we want them to be notified. So if they click on the specific button because they, they got a phishing email, we want them to be prevented from even thinking about adding their username and password because this site was actually not the correct site. We can't expect users to continuously follow up and figure out, am I clicking the right link, yes or no? So in order to provide users that seamless experience, it's up to us to provide the technology and allow um, the interception of, uh, of such behavior. If all of that's going to be encrypted, we'll have to be at the back end of the encrypted channel. We'll have to go and look at the endpoint side. We'll have to go and look if we control the application on the application termination side and find a way to implement that technology. Doing that, we're not going to be by ourselves. That is obvious. The market is big. The market is out there. We're feeding threat intelligence information throughout this whole community. It will require us to be API-based. Like TJ explained, if we can't automate and API the whole thing, we're out of, out of the game. We've started doing this starting R80. We're still expanding APIs, so feel free to keep providing us with feedback on the API that you need, the automation project that you have. I got people in my team that are specializing on helping people develop business cases based on automation. Just that. No, they know the API, they know the automation. 
these guys can help you out and create that application environment that you might be looking for. I consider that looking at Infinity Next as an actual architecture that we started building building blocks for you to piece together the solutions that you're finally after because we're not trying to sell your product. We're trying to offer you a solution that helps you run your business in a secure way, which is much more the discussion we should be having. And obviously the Internet of Things is the new element in there to your right hand side where new things are going to come our way. Auto segmentation, if the device no longer shows the correct behavior, we will move it to a different segment where it cannot harm any other devices in the network anymore. This is important because there's going to be thousands of those devices. It's not going to be a handful like we see with clients and users at the moment. In summary, Zero Trust is a fantastic approach. It's going to be much more labor intensive and we'll have to give up on some of the old paradigms that we used to stick to and open our minds and think about what is this new world for us? What new opportunities can I apply to my network design of the future? That should be very practical and should be very easy to consume for the users because we've learned if we don't make it easy for users, they're going to find a way around us. Key in DevOps. In that, I have a few tips for later today when you are fully satisfied and, and fed with all of the information that you get uh, out of the checkpoint experience. Arrive early, make sure you know where the airport is about. Think about your noise cancelling headphones. They're saving my life when everybody's screaming around me. I just switch on the, uh, the plug and uh, goodbye cruel world. I'm going to be in my own cocoon like the rest of the people. And be nice to cabin crew. Thank you very much.